102.5 FM, KXSFLP, San Francisco, and KXSF.FM. You're tuned in to Spark, informing minds, inspiring ideas, igniting innovation. Let the conversation sink into your soul. This is Kelly Marlowe, host of Spark. What if we could turn human waste into electric power and it would completely alter how we create and access sustainable energy? This is exactly what Professor Giannis Iropoulos did. He is the director of the Bristow Bioenergy Center at the University of the West of England. We will be talking about how his microbial fuel cell technology is enabling the creation of a new energy empowering source for the world. Thank you for joining me on Spark today, Professor Iropoulos. Very welcome, Ellie. <laughs> Can you tell me what P Power is and how it works? Uh, P Power is the a demonstration of how microbial fuel cells work when connected to a, a toilet or a urinal, taking the human waste directly and converting it to electricity. Is it the entire waste or just the urine? It's mostly the liquid. <clears throat> it can be urine, it can also be uh, toilet water. And why is it just only the liquid part? Microbial fuel cells are based on um, microbes, uh, live bacteria, which uh, live inside these um, devices, these units. There has to be liquid movement uh, within the microbial fuel cells to allow for nutrients and feedstock to reach those microbes. Um, If there is a way that we can uh, transport nutrients and feedstock to the microbes, then the microbes, as long as it's organic, they will consume that. Uh, And so in a a system like the ones that we've been building, the the, the nutrients are are carried by the liquid. So that's the easiest way of keeping the microbes uh, healthy and happy. How did you come up with the potential of pee or urine? This is research that we've been doing for nearly 20 years, and um, uh, uh, the, the, we've we've looked at uh, different aspects of this microbial fuel cell or bioelectrochemical systems uh, technology. Uh, and through the years, we we have experimented with numerous organic uh, substrates, types of uh, feedstock. Um, most of that uh, has been uh, originating from municipal wastewater and different types of um, uh, grey water and and, uh, and industrial kind of uh, wastes, uh, and inevitably through the years of research, we we we, we came <clears throat> up against the question: what happens with human waste directly? Uh, and so we had to address that question scientifically, uh, and so we set up our microbial fuel cell units in the lab and started experimenting with uh, with human urine um, to discover that it's probably one of the better substrates that we can be uh, converting to electricity directly. As I understand it, it also cleans or sanitizes the wastewater. So does that mean that once you pull the energy from the waste, the uh, bacteria, correct? And then yeah. you're able to sanitize the water, then it can be reused? Potentially, yes. And this is a big part of the work we've, we've been doing, especially under the funding from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. So the way that these microbes work is exactly the same as in our natural environment. The microbial communities, as they exist, um, they, they consume... The, they break down the different compounds in their natural environment and they take up those nutrients, those elements that they need for their growth and maintenance. By taking up the, the elements that they need from a compound, this is effectively breaking it down, consuming those elements that they need and rejecting those that they don't need. And this is exactly how spotted treatment uh, works with biological means. 
and and therefore how microbial fuel cells, uh, whilst at the same time generating electricity, they can treat uh, or sanitize the the waste. As I understand it, the way you have created the system, it requires no water or sewer connections. Can you explain? That's yes, that's the the technology uh, requires fuel to go in, and and in this particular case, the the fuel is is the human waste, the urine or the or the toilet water or the dirty water that we we would like to clean and generate energy from. <clears throat> because these microbes are naturally occurring, we we effectively pick them up from from their natural habitats in the environment and bring them inside these microbial fuel cells to their new home. <clears throat> Those microbes will require nothing more than the, the same minerals, elements, and nutrients that they had access to in their natural habitat. And so if we put a, a P-power system together, all we need to ensure is that there is fuel, in other words, human waste, feeding into these devices and the microbes are happy. <clears throat> the system does not require water, that's correct. It doesn't require any other form of energy input purely because we are exploiting a, a natural process of biodegradation um, with the only difference that we are doing it in a device which allows us to uh, convert some of that biodegradation into electricity. It is so interesting. Can you talk about where the source of power is currently installed and how it works? Yeah, so as part of the work we've we have been doing for for our funders for the Gates Foundation, the UK uh, uh, Engineering and Physical Sciences Research Council, as well as the European Commission, there is an expectation that the work that we do in the lab, uh, for as long as we've demonstrated the the value and the, the, the feasibility of the, of the technology in the lab, we have to test it outside. So in the, in the last uh, five years, we have taken the technology to initially to the Glastonbury Music Festival in the UK uh, and installed it as a, as a P-Power urinal for, for the festival goers to, to go and use but more importantly, to see how their waste, which normally goes down the drain, can generate useful levels of electricity that can then be used to illuminate the, the urinal that we take. The work funded by the Gates Foundation in particular is about poorer communities of, of our society, and especially those peri-urban or rural communities that are disconnected from the grid, from the sewerage systems, uh, and from any other kind of infrastructure that we are used to having. And so the technology has been tested in a rural setting in Kisoro, Uganda. It has also been tested in a, in a peri-urban setting in uh, Durban, South Africa. And we currently have a system in uh, North Mathare, in uh, Nairobi, Kenya, which is uh, inside a, a, a mixed school, has been installed to provide electricity to power the lights of the, of the toilets of, of that school. As I understand it, definitely the one in Uganda, it's powering the, the toilets and the lighting mm. so that the girls can stay safe within the school. That's right. And it's also, is it what it's currently um, being used for is in schools in, in Africa? Uh, Sub-Saharan Africa in, in particular, uh, not, not that we're, we're not uh, looking to, uh, to, to deploy elsewhere, but those were the areas that we were able to establish the, the contacts and, and go and, and, and primarily address a, a need. And you have touched upon that need, uh, Kelly. The, um, uh, the first installation in Uganda has been a, a girls' uh, secondary boarding school, which, which means that uh, the majority of, of the pupils at that school would, would stay there for months. And so there, there are the, the dormitories and the classrooms and the toilet blocks. And it's a, it's a campus which is kind of fenced all around. 
but has had uh, intrusions from time to time, unfortunately. The place where intruders uh, as well as reptiles would be hiding, would be inside the, the toilets. So that was the, the first thing we identified, that this, the, there's a real need for stable lighting to be provided at that toilet environment so that the girls feel safer when they, when they go to use the toilets, especially at, at night. And so we had uh, the system installed uh, downhill from the toilet block so that the liquid would, would kind of freely flow into our microbial fuel cells. And we were powering a light module outside the toilet block to illuminate the path leading up to the toilet block. And in, <clears throat> individual lights inside the cubicles, uh, which would switch on once a pupil would enter the, the cubicle and then would automatically switch off once they exited the, the cubicle. So that was that was the, the, <clears throat> the value that the technology provided, which was uh, not only the electricity, so that the, an example of what the technology could do, but in this case, the, the social impact was the feeling of, of safety for the girls purely because of, of the illumination. It sounds like you're going to be taking it commercial. That's right. That's correct. My question then is, you have to ensure there's enough waste to create energy, right? How much waste mm-hmm. does it take to generate electric power? Any volume of waste that can enter our systems will, will be turned into um, electricity. It's a continuous process. These microbes have been there for millennia, and they have been converting, biodegrading, uh, organic matter into other different byproducts which we we see in our natural environment and <clears throat> under certain conditions some of those byproducts are um, electricity uh, and uh, other nutrients that we can recover from that that process the microbial fuel cell itself as a device can come in different form factors it can be miniaturized to micro scale microliter scale it can be scaled up to liter, liters, tens of liters, hundreds of liters. And so the, the amount of volume required to produce electricity is defined by the, the geometric volume of our device. We have taken an approach over the years, which is to miniaturize the individual microbial fuel cells because we, we saw that we, we get more energy uh, density out of, of that approach, and then multiply those smaller devices in the tens, hundreds, thousands, <clears throat> and connect them all together to get to the desired levels of voltage and current, i.e. power, um, to to drive uh, the, the different applications. So if, I, if we were to, uh, let's say, if, if I wanted to power a, a, a toy, a small toy, just to demonstrate how the technology works, I will be using very small amounts of human waste to demonstrate that. However, if I wanted to demonstrate how the technology could power a whole, a whole household, then by virtue of the volume of heroes that I'll need to be connecting together, I will need a lot more human waste to be able to produce that level of power. Does it conserve energy if you're not feeding it? It does. Um, this is a, a, a kind of a, a more um, secondary or tertiary reaction that we see in the, in the, in the fuel cells. The microbes have got this unique ability of going into dormancy if they sense that there's not enough energy around. So rather than, than giving up and, and dying, if I, can, if I can use plain language like that, they will switch off many of their active mechanisms and retain active only those that they require for survival until such time uh, energy is then available and then they they wake up all those different things that they've put to sleep. And in doing so, when they they go into dormancy, we have seen that there are some chemicals that are accumulating inside the microwave fuel cells, which one could perceive as chemical energy storage that those communities are capable of. And once there's fuel arriving, 
then we see different reactions taking place, microbes springing back to life again and, and uh, electricity being generated directly. It's a, it's a bit of a complicated topic to, to address in a, in a simple question. There's a lot of good science that is happening to understand how these microbes survive um, periods of starvation. How long do these microbial cells last? And can you easily replace them? Uh, one of the things that we have been looking at has been the, the easy replacement. So to take the second part of your question first. So <clears throat> our, our, our systems uh, come in, in modules. Um, and, so, and, and this is precisely so, so that we can remove uh, broken or failing modules with, with new ones without necessarily taking the whole system apart and, and rebuilding it from, from scratch. The first part of your question, how long do they last? The answer is for as long as we can provide them with, with fuel. Um, microorganisms, they multiply by fission, uh, which, which means that there, there are always n- new progeny new daughter cells produced by the parent cells within a community for as long as fuel is available. <clears throat> it's the same, the same, I can use the same example as our gut microflora. Um, <clears throat> we're, we're born with it and we, we grow with it and we, and we carry our microflora and it, and it evolves um, alongside our lifestyle. We don't necessarily go and replace it unless there's something seriously wrong medically. The same principle applies for the biofilms inside these microbial fuel cells. The microbes will continuously grow and maintain themselves for as long as we provide them with the the fuel which contains the nutrients for their growth and maintenance. Are there any downside to using your intricity? Yes, uh, I would say that there are, depending on how we we, we look at the, the technology. We, we are used to a, a lifestyle whereby we, you know, we, we expect that there's a grid, we expect that there's power available at the, at the socket, and when we plug our devices to those uh, mains um, sockets, we expect that there's less power always there. It's rarely when we think, where does the power come from and how do we ensure that it continues being available. I, I made that, that kind of small introduction because one of the, the differentiating factors for uh, microbial fuel cells, precisely because we work with microbes, with bacteria, is that their rates of reaction are slower compared to chemical rates of reaction or enzymatic rates of reaction. And when, when I say rates of reaction, when something has a faster rate of reaction, we usually see a, a greater magnitude of that reaction. And, and when, when we quantify this in terms of power, we see greater levels of power from faster rates of reaction. So the microbial uh, contingent in the microbial fuel cell, because of their biologically slower rates of reaction, produces lower levels of absolute power output. And if I was to compare, let's say, a chemical battery with a microbial fuel cell, then there is a difference in terms of the, of the amount of power I have available. But if these systems are configured appropriately and connected in the right manner, we can stack them up to the same levels of what we are used to from our conventional means of uh, power generation. And the, and the great advantage is that all we have to do is feed them with, uh, with waste. It does take a lot of work to get to that point. There's still a lot of work that we need to do to get to that point before we see microbial fuels as being ubiquitously used uh, anywhere in the, in the world. And these are some of the challenges that we are we are facing because usually what we are faced with is how does it compare with double A batteries or AAA batteries or different types of chemical batteries? How does it compare with an electric vehicle 
battery. How does it, does it compare with photovoltaics? There, there is a comparison to be made, but at, at this point in time, it's still premature because of the how early uh, stage this technology is at. So what you're saying is that it's not going to have the same fast reaction or charge that other energy sources may have at this time? Yeah, it, it doesn't have, uh, and it will never have. The, the, those rates of reaction because it's not a chemical process; it's a biochemical process, and the and the and the, and the dominating factor in the microbial fuel cell is is the microbial community. There's that, that's a thermodynamic limit. There's very little we can do about that. But what we can do is engineer our systems to have lo- a lot more of them connected together without necessarily occupying huge fields of space. To do that, and and once appropriately connected, we can have uh, those desired levels of power output, and we can envisage households uh, and even communities having at least some of their power coming from their own waste directly converted to electricity. Interesting. But could you build fewer cells uh, utilizing materials that are not sustainable for the planet since human waste is completely biodegradable? <clears throat> that's, a, that's a very good question, um, Kelly. And, and the, the answer is yes. Um, there has been evidence already published about microbial communities that are able to degrade different types of uh, hormones, different types of plastics and microplastics, even... Uh, different types of toxic uh, compounds. Um, and the beauty of these um, organisms, there, there's a plethora of species that have been reported, uh, depending on what we would like to see being broken down. Uh, the beauty is that these microbes, uh, if the appropriate species is used for the appropriate non-biodegradable uh, material, they they have a unique way of actually taking up when breaking down the compounds, they still take up those elements that they need for their growth and maintenance. And by doing that, they neutralize the toxicity of a toxin, for example, or the efficacy of a pollutant. Breaking down plastic would be really big. (laughs) (laughs) Now that you're going commercial with this, at what scale do you think it will be possible for this? Since currently it's the projects in third world countries, right, where there's no electricity or limited access to electricity? And I think the question is really, you know, with large-scale city, especially now with use of massive amount of energy through devices, data centers, Mm. do you think it can scale to that size for cities? Um, In the future, uh, I would certainly say yes, and I'd like to believe that that that's going to happen. Uh, one day for for the for the near and, and mid term, and, and again uh, answering your question, um, Kelly, I, I think we need to start taking it a step by step. So um, we've demonstrated how a urinal uh, with or a toilet block with its with its cubicles can be illuminated. We've demonstrated how the same technology, when configured appropriately, can charge mobile phones and different other devices, how it can run DC motors, how it can actuate different types of uh, applications. Um, so at, at this scale, it, it, has, it has been done. It can, and it can be engineered so it can start getting integrated into these parts of, of life. When scaling it up, uh, our approach, and this is what we have been looking with the, the uh, our funders from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, is to take it from a initially from a, a household level, then to a community level, and in doing so, understand the engineering challenges of how we would scale up from the one level to the next before we can then take on the challenge of going beyond the community. In, in principle, in theory, it, it will work. We, we know it will work and we've seen it from theory to the small scale practice in the lab to the slightly larger scale practice outside of the lab. We've, we've done it at the toilet level, which has been used by 
hundreds, if not thousands of people at the Glastonbury Music Festival. And so it is conceivable to think how the technology can be uh, engineered, designed um, to fit into a household and provide the energy needed by that um, household. And as we're doing these things, we will be understanding what other challenges we need to be addressing from materials science perspective, from a scalability uh, perspective, the cost, for example. Um, and as we are addressing those challenges, we envisage that the technology can then be scaled up to uh, 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 higher and higher levels. The other benefit that you've been able to create is that they can <coughs> convert human waste into fertilizer. Do you see any mm. other applications that may come out of this technology? There's, there's the when when the, the technology is running, there's as we said the electricity generation and the the treated spend effluent that comes out can then be used as a fertilizer. And depending, remember what we said earlier about the design and the geometry of the microbial fuel cells, depending on how we we configure our microbial fuel cells, we have also seen that there, there's a, a an efficacious liquid, a, a second type of liquid byproduct that is synthesized during the bioelectrochemical reactions, which we have seen uh, working as, a, as a, a potent disinfectant and bactericidal. Initially, we were collecting this liquid and um, started investigating, analyzing it to understand what it's made of, how it, does it get synthesized and what can we use it for. But there's now uh, a lot of interest in being able to build microbial fuel cell systems to produce electricity and treat the, the wastewater, but also produced, produce good volumes of this um, uh, synthesized liquid that can be collected, bottled, and used as a, as a surface disinfectant and as, a, as an agent to kill uh, pathogenic uh, organisms. That's amazing. So you can get electricity, you can get potentially clean water, and yeah. you can get a disinfectant. Yeah. I can't wait. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Will the price it's... of electricity drop significantly in the world, <laughs> do you think, if this was to be implemented? That, well, that would certainly be a factor for uh, considering to uh, reduce the price of, of electricity. There, there, of course, will have to be uh, <clears throat> things done to the infrastructure to be able to uh, take this on, but it's it's not insurmountable and, it, and it's not going to be more difficult than, for example, how photovoltaics have, have taken off and uh, where there's excess uh, uh, electricity can then be fed back to the to the grid. And um, so if, there, if there's a way that we we have done it with other technologies, then it's certainly possible to do it with the, mi the microbial fuel cells. And the, and the reason why quite possibly the price of electricity would decrease is that with this technology, you, you will not need anything other than the waste that is generated continuously to keep it uh, up and running. Well, thank you for sharing your innovation and explaining mm -hmm. it so clearly. I understood everything. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> and thank you for joining okay. me on Spark today. Thank you, Kelly. Thank you for, for your interest.